Okay, so here's um, you guys are doing pretty good. So I think you've kind of understood how you should be studying. So my suggestion to all of you is to go into every topic, make sure you know the key concepts. Always look through the key concepts. So look at classification of muscles. So keep your PowerPoint on the side and see how muscle is classified. Remember, you can classify it based on structure. You know. Striated, non-striated. Then you can classify based on function, um, voluntary, uh, voluntary, involuntary, and then you know how, how you put the two together. So that is one. Should know the functions and properties. Some of these terms which are there. Okay. So always go through. Make sure you kind of understand. Look at your PowerPoint because a visual image always makes a big difference. If you in your head you think of a band and you can see thick and thin filaments in it. And you know the question is worded in a little different manner. The moment you kind of you know close your eyes and think of it, okay, that's where it is. That's how the A band is. The I band only has thin filaments, and it has the Z disc in between. Okay, so always know that. So look at all the terms. See, for example, sarcoplasmic reticulum function, T tubules, and you know you got questions in your quizzes. What are T tubules uh, part of? You know they are invaginations of the sarcolemma. Similarly, sliding filament mechanism. What does it do? Motor unit, neuromuscular junction. So all of these are really, really important. So make sure you kind of look at these key concepts. If there's any concept which you can't really vocalize, um, quickly go back to your notes and take a look at that. Okay. So same way, if we go back to so that was for muscle physiology. I'm not going into the other part. So let's say we go to muscular system. So again, here types of muscles with characteristics, the nerve supply. Remember, skeletal is through the somatic, cardiac and smooth through autonomic nervous system. These are some terms that we use, uh, factors which determine muscle contraction, you know, the major groups of muscles. So again, you must know the, the definitions of these, what is rice treatment, um, how would you name muscles. So this, you know, for this, you, you have the different names and I asked you questions so you can, you know, go back and take a look at that. Um, and a lot of it is common sense because, you know, we, when we name a muscle, we can mix and match a few. For example, we can use location, we can use action, um, you know, we can use and the shape or something like that. We can use all together. So that's really important to kind of go through these um, these concepts and be sure you know each one of them. OK, uh, look over your quizzes, see how the questions are worded. Um, Look through each one very carefully. Don't always look for the right answer. See why the others were wrong, okay? Because the wrong answer to one question might be the right answer to another question. So that becomes really important, okay? Uh, any questions that you have at this point which you might want me to go over before I kind of do a little short uh, millionaire review? Can you go over rice again? Okay, rice. Um, so... Rice treatment is a done for any muscle which is either stretched too much or, you know, torn. Um, the R, so let me see, let me just, uh, yeah, uh, I'll just open a Word document. Okay. Okay, you got it? Uh, okay. So, anyway, so let's see here. I just couldn't remember it when you said it, so. Oh. So rice is um, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Um. Oh, well, I mean, you you want to rest the 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 muscle for as long as is needed you don't you never want to put too much ice for too long because ice causes vasoconstriction it prevents swelling so you always kind of put it for a, sh a few minutes and then take it off and you know maybe 10 minutes ma or 15 max and take it off you you can't don't keep it on uh, you compress you know for a few days and you keep the limb elevated so that the swelling comes down okay. anything else yes Okay. Okay. Sure. 
So um, the question was, you wanted me to draw the motor end plate and um, the nerve axon terminal, right? The neuromuscular junction. Okay, got it. So here, so let's look. So here's the neuromuscular junction. So this is the axon terminal. And inside here, you have a lot of synaptic vesicles which contain acetylcholine, which is the neurotransmitter. At the other end, we have the muscle. It's called neuromuscular. So this is the nerve part of it, the neuro part of it. The muscular part of it is the muscle, right? So in the muscle, so when you take a muscle fiber like this, this is the sarcolemma, okay? So when the nerve comes and synapses here, and these are the axon terminals, at this point where the nerve is coming, the muscle, the sarcolemma is actually folded in. So the folding of the muscle is known as the motor end plate. So this part is just folded in like this, and then it becomes straight out there because the neuromuscular junction is usually at the center of a muscle fiber, right? Okay? So this is called the motor end plate. So that's the muscular part of it, motor end plate. And the nerve and this motor end plate are separated by the synaptic cleft. Now on this motor end plate, because acetylcholine has, is going to be released from these synaptic vesicles into this synaptic cleft, it's got to attach to something in order to stimulate this motor end plate. So on the surface of this motor end plate, you cannot see it with the naked eye, but imagine that there are certain sort of areas here where this acetylcholine can attach. Those are known as acetylcholine receptors. Okay, those are called acetylcholine receptors. So when a nerve impulse comes, so imagine a nerve impulse is traveling down the nerve from the central nervous system, it comes down, it comes all the way and it comes to this dilated part, which is this axon terminal, which is this area. So the nerve impulse has come now all the way down. So calcium ions are present in the extracellular fluid, which surrounds this axon. So here we have some calcium ions present. The arrival of the nerve impulse causes this calcium ions to move into the axon terminal. From the outside, they move inside. So this is the first place that calcium acts. When it acts on this uh, when it comes into this axon terminal, what it does is it causes these synaptic vesicles to travel down towards the bottom of this axon terminal, which is known as the axolemma. So they move from here and they come down. And so when they come down here, so imagine they travel down, they come here, and they fuse with this. When they fuse with this, this part kind of breaks off and the neurotransmitter is released into the synaptic cleft. The idea, the function of this neurotransmitter is to stimulate the muscle and begin something known as the action potential, okay? So this neurotransmitter attaches to these acetylcholine receptors. When it attaches to these receptors, it does something to the membrane. And this we did right in the beginning in, in chemistry. Remember you had receptors and they change membrane permeability. So what it does is it changes the membrane permeability of this sarcolemma. So in a muscle cell, if this is the sarcolemma, normally there's more sodium outside and there is potassium inside. They are both positive charges, but the sodium outside is much more than there is potassium. So positive charges are more on the outside and not so much positive charge on the inside. So at a resting level, we say that the inside is, is set of negatively charged compared to the outside or less positively charged compared to the outside. So when this binds to this um, sarcolemma, what it does is it changes this membrane permeability and it allows sodium to go in. Normally, sodium cannot go in, okay? So when sodium goes in, now you get more positive charges on the inside so the inside is less negatively charged compared to the outside. Get it? Okay. So once it does that, when sodium goes in, then we say that the muscle is depolarized. The word we use is the muscle is depolarized. And this occurs in patches. So the impulse spreads in either direction, this way and it will spread that way. Okay. So sodium starts going in. After some time, that stops. And potassium goes out because, you know, you want to kind of restore the ionic balance 
right? So potassium goes out and this keeps spreading. So one area gets depolarized, it goes here. This area then potassium starts going out, this area sodium comes in. So the area where potassium starts going out, then we say that area is getting repolarized. In other words, it's going to now wait for the next nerve impulse to come, okay? So in patches, areas get depolarized and then repolarized. So this impulse travels all the way like this on either side. If you remember, you had in relation to the ax axon um, or the sarcolemma, there were areas where the sarcolemma kind of dipped in. And those areas where it dipped in, we call them T-tubules, right? And inside a muscle, if you look at a muscle cell, and if I draw it here, if you look at a muscle cell, this is the sarcolemma. And let's say the sarcolemma has kind of gone in it's invaginated in like this inside. So it's gone in and come out. So it goes in and comes out, right? Okay, like a fold. Inside the muscle, remember you had this sarcoplasmic reticulum which was present, which was the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And this was dilated in certain areas where it kind of just looked a little bit dilated like this. And where it was dilated, that part was known as terminal cistern. You remember I said cistern was like a tank, okay? The function of these was to store calcium and release it. And why is calcium important? Because this calcium inside the muscle, that changes. Remember, it attaches to something called troponin and it turns the troponin around and makes the active sites visible so that myosin can attach to the active sites. The tropomyosin, remember, was blocking those active sites, right? In the end, what do you want? You want myosin to attach to the uh, actin filament so they can pull it towards the center, so they can pull towards the center so that the sarcomere shortens. That's your final, that's what you're aiming for, right? In order to get there, first you have to stimulate the muscle. You depolarize it. When you depolarize it, the impulse travels. As it travels, it'll come down the T-tubules, right? It'll travel down the T-tubules. These T-tubules are very close to this terminal cistern. You see, here's the T-tubule. So it stimulates the terminal cistern on either side, which releases calcium ions. Those calcium ions do that, to, you know, changing the configuration of the actin filament. So the active sites are uh, exposed. So the myosin then grabs the and attaches to those active sites, right? And it pulls the actin filaments towards the center, so your sarcomere shortens and muscle contraction is brought about, okay? So this is actually what is excitation-contraction coupling. That means it's a coupling or marriage of the two. This part is the excitation part, this area where the nerve impulse arrives. This is the excitation part. The contraction is this where the myosin attaches to action, actin and causes the contraction. So you need both to occur in order for the muscle to actively contract. Okay? So that's, that's what it means. Any other uh, questions? No? So you're good? Okay, so let's, uh, let me, uh, so just a few questions I'm going to ask you, and again, we'll divide the class into two groups, okay? So again, my advice is go over your questions, um, go over your uh, PowerPoints, um, uh, sorry, your notes and PowerPoints and everything, but go over your quizzes and when you look at a question in the test, I might have changed the question, um, you know, for example, in the, in the quiz, I might ask you, uh, A bands contain actin and myosin, that would be your answer. But in the test, it would be, uh, might be I bands. What do I bands contain, right? So I might have changed it a little bit. So which is why when you look at your quizzes, make sure you look at all the answers correctly and try in your head to figure out why is this wrong? Why is this wrong? And why is this one correct? Okay, so that's the way to go about it. So we'll divide it that side and this side. We'll start with this side. Okay, the $100 question. So what is the source of energy for muscle action? So this group. B. B? Okay. ATP. Good. 
the other side. What is a motor unit? So you can see here how I'm asking you about, you know, all those definitions that you needed. Could someone just turn the first light off, please? Thank you. Yeah. Come on. You guys should know this. Yeah, what, Alicia? See? Did you? You say C? No, it's for them. No? Okay. It is C. Remember, the number of muscle fibers innervated by single nerve fiber is a motor unit, okay? Okay. Now this one you should get right. C. C, yes. Okay, so the test questions are going to be just this easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> If you know it, everything is really easy. So I'm not really asking you any, not anything that was not in your notes. You guys. Which one? All of the above? You say all of the above? Let them answer. A, yes. The main... I'm asking sarcoplasmic, that's not what causes depolarization and repolarization. Remember, depolarization is because of sodium ions going in into the uh, muscle, and that was because of the arrival of nerve impulse, the acetylcholine binding to the receptors, and it was a change in membrane permeability. It had nothing to do with sarcoplasmic reticulum. What they do is they store calcium and they release it, they release it so that that calcium can bind to the troponin and change the, the configuration of actin, okay? So here you can see how function of every single structure that you learn is very, very, very important. Which one? D, everybody agrees? Yes. Hypertrophy is increase in the size of muscle fibers. And let's go back. I just want to go back to that question. And what is increase in number of muscle fibers called? Is that hyperplasia? Hyperplasia, yes. And the uterus was the only physiological organ, uh, only organ in which physiologically it happened. What is decrease in number of muscle fibers called? Atrophy. Atrophy. Remember, which happens, you know, sometimes with oh, disuse atrophy. When the, we saw how excitation, contraction, coupling was important. So if you cut off the nerve, the muscle, everything is there in the muscle. But if it doesn't get stimulated, it's not going to act, right? So it undergoes what's called disuse atrophy, right? It becomes, it shrinks. And there's nothing that increases neuromuscular um, junction. Okay, you guys. Come on. Think logically, which do you think would be most effective? There are some things you cannot do. B, yes. 
look at this. If you stimulate the same motor units repeatedly, remember when a muscle acts, when the motor unit is stimulated, all the muscle fibers it's, it is responsible for, they will contract to the fullest. So if you keep stimulating that, only those muscle fibers are going to be stimulated. Remember I gave you that example. If you want to pick up a light book, you just stimulate a few motor units. If you want to pick up a heavy chair, you stimulate more motor units, right? Because you need more power. So the body is really economical. So I'm telling you, the increasing the force of contraction effectively involves stimulating more motor units. If more motor units are stimulated, more of the muscle fibers will be stimulated. You'll be able to... Be, your action will be more powerful. You cannot increase the nerve supply to a muscle, right? That, that's absolutely not possible. And if you stimulate more muscles, I'm, I'm talking about one particular muscle here. Look, read the question. It says, increasing the force of contraction of a muscle, right? So stimulating more muscles just allows you to do more work. But I'm not, I'm not asking about that. I'm asking how will you increase the power of contraction in one muscle, right? So these two automatically kind of, are knocked off. Then you start thinking about this. So this is like beating a dead horse. You keep beating the same thing over and over again. You can't do anything. Instead, you need to stimulate more motor units so that more muscle fibers get activated and hence the power of the muscle is, uh, the muscle's contraction becomes more powerful. Okay? This group. C, yes. So if you cross only one joint, it's a short, powerful muscle, but range of action is much less. Only that acts only on that joint. Okay. A, yes. Remember, red myoglobin is like hemoglobin, so hemoglobin bound to, um, that's what gave, it binds to oxygen, and that's what gives red cells their color, the he pigment hemoglobin. So same thing, this is very similar, so it gives skeletal muscle its color. Such muscles which have hemoglobin, uh, myoglobin in them, they don't fatigue easily because they can bind oxygen. So remember, they were the, what were called slow oxidative fibers, so they were muscles which would go on and on for a, lo a long time. And, you know, remember marathon runners tend to have more of them because, you know, you need energy for an extremely long time. They are not quick acting. They are slow acting. They are called slow oxidative, okay? And they are red in color. C, yes. Was it your turn? No. Okay. <laughs> yes. Two heads, um, biceps, it's two heads, and always read. Femoris means in related to femur. Femur is the thigh bone, so in the thigh. Yeah, the, no, there's a bicep, but we call it, that's why you have to call it biceps brachii. Okay? You guys. So think of the principles of muscle action. See? Yes. Remember, they cross the hip joint posteriorly. So they're in, at the hip, it's like everywhere in the body. When a muscle crosses posterior, it causes extension. When a muscle crosses anterior, it causes flexion. But remember, from the knee, the rule changes. It becomes exactly the opposite, right? So when they cross the knee posteriorly, they'll cause flexion of the knee, okay? So extension of the hip and flexion of the knee. You guys.
C. How many people agree with C? Okay, the others, what choice do you? You say C and you say A? Simultaneous contraction of its antagonist? C. The reason it can't be, see, if a muscle is contracting, and if its antagonist is also contracting, if you're pulling from one end and somebody else is also pulling from the other end, you're going to have no movement, right? So if, if the main muscle, the prime mover is contracting and its antagonist is also contracting, and think of it, biceps. So if the biceps is contracting, in order for it to contract, can you understand how the triceps has to relax and actually stretch? If it was contracting, it's going to pro produce its action. So there'll be no movement. Both are acting together, right? So there'll be no movement. So it can't be this. It's relaxation of other muscles producing the same movement. Other muscles are synergists, right? So you want them to contract with it. So it's not that. It has to be relaxation of the antagonist. It's only if the antagonist relaxes, allows itself to be stretched, will this prime mover be able to act, okay? So it causes relaxation of the antagonist. So this was just, again, going over that principles. A, yes, muscles that cross flexion will cross behind the joint. Just now we did like the, uh, the hamstrings that cause extension will cross in front of a joint, okay? This is from the knee downwards. So that's why muscles crossing in front of the knee, like the quadriceps causes extension. Muscles crossing in front of the ankle cause dorsiflexion, okay? Okay, you guys. B? You say B. You say B. How many people go with B? The sides? Oh, no, I'm thinking the sides. Which one? D, yes. The total number of muscle fibers available for contraction. Remember, bulky muscles are powerful muscles. The more muscles there are, I mean, more muscle fibers there are, the more powerful it will be, okay? Think of it that way. So that's what it's saying, the total number of muscle fibers. So if a muscle is small, it, will be, it won't be powerful. If a muscle is large, it will have more muscle fibers, hence more powerful, okay? So it's, you didn't have D as an option, though, the number of insertions. No, number of insertions doesn't increase the power, determine no, the power. it would lessen the, the power, wouldn't it? If there's more, ins if it inserts in more than one place. Not necessarily, it doesn't, um, it increases the range, it doesn't really decrease the power. For example, there's a muscle called tibialis posterior, which inserts in, on many bones, they're very close. It does nothing to reduce the power. Okay. Yeah. Um, you take a muscle like extensor digit, all the digitorums, they go to all the digits. See, they've got four insert, four different places, so it doesn't decrease the power. Yeah. And you guys, last question. Again, principles of muscle action. You say A? D, yeah, see it's crossing in front of the knee joint. We just had a question. Remember the rule changes, yeah? Crosses in front. Remember your quadriceps. You all know your quadriceps. Think of it when it's contracting. What is it going to do? So work it on yourself. It's going to cause extension of the knee. The hamstrings which are behind the knee, they cause flexion, okay? Okay. Any 